All right, just confirming. Can hear me and see my screen? I saw the thumbs up. Beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hope you all had a nice um, early lunch. Um, I'm zooming in today from um, Ghana country. Um, so I'd like to pay my respects to the Ghana people and their elders past and present. And I also recognize um, the traditional owners of the lands on which uh, you're meeting Emerald zooming in from today. There's always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And I want to thank the organizers for this conference, making it possible uh, to attend this conference and present virtually and also for making it free and accessible that way as well. So thank you so much. Uh, so today, yes, talk about um, YA fiction and articulating genders and sexualities. So I'd like to begin with this quote from bisexual activist Robin Oakes. Labels should not be boxes into which we feel we must squeeze ourselves, but rather tools with which to communicate and to begin conversations, end quote. <clears throat> Language is fluid, malleable and creative, allowing for nuance and helping us articulate ourselves. By resisting the heteronormative labels given to us, there is a field of possibility for imagining and realising new ways of being. Using fitting labels and pronouns can be an important part of self-determination for LGBTQI plus people, and reflecting the potential of language in YA fiction may offer a reflection for young people to see themselves or a window in to see others. At the same time, labels for sexualities and gender can be a source of frustration. From rigid notions of identity maintaining the status quo to the complex approaches to language in our community that may lead to misunderstandings and divisions on how terms are used and applied. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, so given that, my labels are white, bisexual, cisgender woman, so I recognise my limitations in writing LGBTQ plus characters and intersecting identities in queer YA fiction. Queer YA refers to stories featuring young adult LGBTQ plus characters and content. My creative writing PhD was an artefact and exegesis, or my artefact included a collection of original queer YA short stories, and the exegesis critiqued the writing processes and outcome. I consulted with a total of 13 LGBTQ plus young people in a series of five writing workshops. Participants were aged 18 to 25 at the time and interested in writing themselves. I wrote sections of the book, then received feedback on early draft excerpts and redrafted based on my dialogues with participants. Participants also discussed queer storytelling, tested writing exercises and shared their original work. This presentation considers the challenges of language and labels used to describe LGBTQ plus identities and expressions through workshop dialogues and excerpts of the short stories. Firstly, I'll explore how language affects the friendship between characters Benji and Luke, including labels for gender expression and slurs. Then I reflect on approaches to non-gendered or gender expansive pronouns in drafting stories. Participants share their thoughts about language and provide feedback on excerpts from the artifact shared. In my artifact, friends Benji and Luke, who are both gay cisgender male characters, create a pride club at their school. Benji enjoys traditionally feminine things like makeup and romance books, while Luke distances himself from femininity. While Benji and when Benji and Luke argue over running the club under the club, their different personalities, including their gender expression and relationship to pride, clash. A draft excerpt of the dialogue was shared in a workshop with participants. Um, on the screen here, we have a quote here from Michael, who shared how the character tension is present in society at large in how gay men are treated. He said, quote, I feel like there's this pressure that queer men often face to be normal in inverted commas guy. Like a lot of people will be like, oh yeah, I love gay guys so long as they're normal and I can have like a conversation with them. And it's like, that's literally all gay guys. You were just uncomfortable around feminine presenting, not even presenting feminine ones. Another participant, Ren, noted how this issue is being explored in other queer YA texts, signaling its potential importance to writers and readers of LGBTQ plus texts. She said, it reminded me of a couple scenes in camp by Elsie Rosen, where it's like a similar thing of a sort of mass presenting gay boy, realizing he's kind of internalized his homophobia and he expects gay people to be a particular way. If you're femme, then you're presenting rather than being who you are. In giving workshop feedback, on the scene, Michael critiqued the terminology used for Benji's gender expression. One thing I didn't like is the use of femme spelled F-E-M-M-E, -E, because from what I know, that's often a lesbian term, meaning a very specific thing that's not just feminine. So I think in this context, we can more appropriate to spell it 
as an abbreviation of feminism, because that's the context it's being used in. And participant Dorian also agreed with his point. Fem theorist Ray Ashley Hoskin acknowledges the origins of the term fem to describe traditionally feminine cisgender lesbians attracted to masculine or butch lesbians. The definition of fem beyond feminine presentation and characteristics that Michael refers to is a marked difference of queer approaches to femininity from modes of patriarchal femininity. The fem label and identity has been adopted by bisexual women, queer men, trans and gender non-conforming people, and the wider spectrum of sexualities and genders. Yet who can use the term has been debated in LGBTQ plus spaces, including people who argue the word has been appropriated and should be reserved for lesbian women. While I recognize and respect the significance of this term within lesbian history, such arguments have problematically excluded trans and gender non-conforming people from the lesbian community, nor recognize femphobia as a problem encountered by LGBTQ plus people, including men who identify as or are perceived as femme. And on the bottom there, we have a quote from Hoskin who defines femphobia as prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed ag against someone who is perceived to identify, embody, or express femininely and toward people and objects gendered femininely, particularly if they digress from patriarchal femininity, end quote. In revising the scene, I removed the word femme because the dialogue still suggests femphobia, as Michael articulated, without expli explicitly stating this terminology. In, the in that same scene shared with Tippins, uh, Benji observes how his femininity has always been connected to his fatness. Benji challenges Luke's masculine thin idea of desirability by remarking how people may view him as not manly and soft. He counters this negative perception by saying, I like myself, I like being soft. Benji's self-love in a fatphobic society is radical. He identifies as fat as a neutral descriptor, thus rejecting, reinscribing such language as negative and contributing to fat hatred. YA scholar Nicole Animato recognizes language of fatness as either pathologized fat people, such as obese or overweight, or how positive euph euphemisms for fatness attempt to hide negative judgments, such as curvy or chubby. Amato recognizes the word cannot be separated from social understandings of fatness. Many fat studies scholars and activists desire to destigmatize and reclaim the word. This leads me to consider the ways language can harm marginalized peoples. I experimented with how to present slurs in YA given considerations of what is appropriate for young readers without evading the realities of harmful language towards LGBTQ plus people. Many definitions of slurs refer to the intent of such language to disrespect and harm their target, and we've heard about this today. Yet this may be contextual, as examples of such speech appear in music, films and literature, as well as educational and judicial settings. In Excitable Speech, A Politics of the Performative, Judith Butler challenges the notion the, quote, offensive effect of such words is fully contextual, end quote, whereby the words can simply be separated from the injurious power based on the circumstances or deployment by the speaker, nor is context irrelevant as existing power structures and its historic usage contributes to a capacity to harm. The consideration of context and intent for speakers using slurs is relevant to discussing a scene featuring Benji and Luke, the characters of Met, where they discuss homophobic language at a football game. I wanted to avoid the binary of sport as inclusive, exclusive to LGBTQ plus people. So Luke, a football player in a local team himself, describes experiencing allyship from his teammates when they call out one of the players for being a homophobe towards him. This reflects recent inclusive policies and practices in sport. Now in the scene, the two are at an SA NFL game uh, that Luke attends with Benji and his football loving dad. His dad becomes agitated watching a player fumble the ball and exclaims a slur. There are some turned heads and one disapproving look, but nobody vocally opposes his comment. Luke's father, recognizing Luke's expression, tries to dismiss the comment saying, don't look so worried, I wouldn't say that to an actual gay person, and slaps Luke's back in camaraderie. Luke's father thinks using such language ex is excusable when it is not directed intentionally at the targeted group or individual or motivated by homophobia. This attitude fails to consider how the use of homophobic slurs may contribute to normalizing bigotry and discrimination towards LGBTQ plus people. The scene demonstrates the context of slurs is geographical, social, and historical. Homophobic slurs are prevalent in the Australian vernacular 
which Australian historian Amanda Lorgerson argues reflects the construction of Australian masculinity as heterosexual and white, preferably Anglo, that demonises divergence from this such as femininity. The significance of sport to Australian culture carried with it the penchant for swearing and slurs in both playing and spectating. The connection between masculinity and derogatory language is compounded in sport, from schools and amateur clubs to professional rugby and football leagues, where homophobic, sexist and racist language remain ongoing concerns. The scene's depiction of a homophobic slur used while spectating football reveals the normalisation of such language in Australian culture and the influence of Luke's dad on his own feelings about masculinity, homosexuality and femininity. I didn't want to repeat slurs aimed at people and groups I'm not a part of, so I experimented with two methods for centering the slur. The first followed author David Leverthin's device in his short story, Miss Lucy Had a Steamboat, from the collection How They Met and Other Stories. Um, so on the screen on the my right hand side, I think it'll be your right as well, um, I've highlighted uh, the words from page 36 there. Um, so he avoids offensive words by applying them in brackets through not a nice word for lesbian and rather sexually explicit word for gay man. The second method I use was a strike through, which I've also shown on the screen. In consulting with fellow writers, we recognise both methods brought further attention to the word in a way that distracted from the purpose of using it in the first place, it being its usage by people who deny it's problematic, particularly in settings contending with such derogatory language and behaviour like football games. Hence, the slur is only used twice in the short story, characters appropriately act within the context of the narrative, and there is a content warning, which highlights to young readers the harmful impact of such, young, such language on these young gay male characters. Um, another experiment was considering how to present uh, multiple pronouns for one character in fiction. I shared with participants an excerpt featuring a transmasculine character called Alex who uses he, they. In the first workshop, I shared snippets where different characters describe themselves or others, including Alex. I asked participants to consider if the writing in the excerpt flows with multiple sets of pronouns and encouraged any recommendations for where they had seen authors shift between pronouns well. Aspen was interested in how multiple pronouns can be used in text, noting that it was the first time uh, he'd read a piece of literature where the character uses more than one set of pronouns. He continued about how he found following the writing, saying that it was just something they, he wasn't used to seeing in a written form like that. When I asked for any places where participants may have seen such writing, uh, Dorian said uh, he was more familiar with it in informal communication. Uh, I guess because we just mainly speak, because I know people who use multiple sets of pronouns, I've seen that used before, but I don't think I've seen it in any sort of literature that I can think of at the least. Visibility of multiple pronouns in text were more likely to be seen by participants in news articles discussing celebrities, such as Halsey using they, she, and Elliot Page using he, they. At the time of writing, editing the artifact, there were fewer books using multiple pronouns for one character to use as models. The few examples recommended to me were difficult to access or out of print, such as queer solar punk novel Fox Hunt by Aitaroa author Rem Wigmore. American lesbian act trans activist Leslie Feinberg, known for hero gram biking novel Stone Butch Blues, used multiple pronouns as they, she, which is reflected in articles and interviews with her, such as found in the lesbian erotica magazine On Our Backs. The interviewer noted respecting these pronouns, quote, because Feinberg has stressed that if society is to accept transgender people, our language must expand as well, end quote. This signals an area for future research to conduct an in-depth search for such materials to use as exemplars to write multiple pronouns. The short story of Alex also dealt with the importance of writing and fandoms to him and how hurt they were by their favourite creator excluding trans characters. Given this significant theme and that the story was underdeveloped, I removed it from the artefact in drafting for the PhD thesis. Still, participants shared insights on this excerpt that was worthy of discussion. In questionnaire feedback, participants reflected they liked exploring such topics. Andrew wrote, I really like the variation in use of pronouns. And Ren wrote, it was great to see a variety of pronouns used. Um, a participant who provided their feedback anonymously commented workshop one included very inclusive inserts and in-depth discussion on queer writing topics, not often in other writing education spheres, such as the use of multiple sets of pronouns for one character. This indicates discussion of multiple pronouns among other queer writing subjects merits further exploration in this literature. 
and its implementation in writing practices like workshops. Here we can recognise that language has limitations for expressing identities and experiences beyond dominant viewpoints. In the 10th anniversary preface to gender trouble, feminism, the subversion of identity, Butler argued, quote, neither grammar nor style are politically neutral, end quote. Butler responded to criticisms, their writing is difficult to read by claiming received grammar may not be the most useful mode for expressing radical views, given the constraints that grammar imposes upon thought, indeed upon the thinkable itself. If this normalised language limits what can be communicated, it can thus limit a person's ability to be recognised by others and thereby attempts to deny their existence. The problem is then not the use of unconventional use of grammar, but how people are using language to challenge dominant views of genders and sexualities. To end, I want to share a quote from my a book, Tarnish of the Stars by Rosie Thor, that Wren offered during our conversations about labels. We do not have to use the same words or share the same definitions to be similar, to understand one another. Thank you all so much um, for your time. I will share my link tree with my information in the Slack. Looking forward to the rest of the presentations today. Thank you.